this semester, our, our focus is on H. Right? Uh, we are going through uh, the essays. All of, uh, all of the essays are by me. I wrote the essays, and I published them. And uh, I mentioned a lot of other uh, uh, authors. Right? And uh, 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 last Monday, uh, we mentioned John Kitt, John Kitt, a romantic poet. Um, he, he, he is very good, and uh, he is as good as Shakespeare. He died young, but uh, his poetry is uh, probably in English, probably the best one. He was young when he died, and he was very serious also, right? And so everything in the book reveals what kind of person he is, right? Uh, I think the boogie is very moving in a calm way, right? He's not excited, right? From the very beginning to the end, he's very calm, right? Uh, nothing is very sensational, right? Uh, but as a reader, I fully sympathize with uh, what he's saying. Right? I sympathize with him. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, all of you, many of you have felt the same way, I think. The same way as I, as I felt, uh, as I said in the essay. So, uh, you are interested in the book, right? So, why did you get the book? It is a rare book, a very good book. But uh, it is forgotten. And I've just discovered it, right? So, why don't you get the book? It's, uh, it's kind of cheap. And read the book very carefully. Uh, so, my essay is just an introduction, part of the beautiful uh, book. So, try to get the book and uh, read it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, Singh is a great soul, soul, right? And according to uh, some uh, critic, uh, in order to be, uh, in order uh, for his work to be good, he must have a great soul. Brave soul. So that means what? A poet is born, right? An artist is born, right? Of course, uh, if you do not make any effort, then you can't be a good poet, even though you are born with great talent, right? OK. Uh, uh, OK. Uh, also, on Monday, uh, I introduced uh, the last part of the poem, Old on a Grecian Arm, right? Old on a Grecian Arm. It's a famous poem. And the conclusion is uh, the truth itself, right? right? Uh, the conclusion, do you remember the conclusion? Truth is beauty, beauty truth, right? You remember it? So we are talking about uh, beauty throughout the semester, right? Uh, we are looking for beauty in poetry, in Yeshi poetry, and everything. So uh, here is uh, the assignment for you, and a very enjoyable assignment. Uh, currently, an interesting movie is showing. The title of the movie is Renoir. Any of you, any of you saw the movie? Did you see the movie? Movie. Renoir. Who is Renoir? Hmm? A painter. Painter, right? Uh, Renoir is showing at uh, some of the uh, theaters in Seoul. And go to the movie. Go see the movie and write a poem. Right write a very beautiful poem about uh, his painting or his life. And uh, the background of the movie is uh, southern France, very beautiful. And uh, particularly, um, you like the uh, model, right? Uh, the model is the woman. The uh, model is not so beautiful according to, the, to our standard. But uh, 
she is extremely beautiful. He, uh, it, the, it's the ideal model for Renoir. And actually, uh, next week, uh, on Monday, next week, we are going to read an essay. Uh, it's a comparison between uh, Yeats and Renoir. I think uh, you'll find it very interesting because uh, uh, nobody has ever touched on uh, uh, this, this topic, right? Uh, no critic, no scholar has ever written a comparison, a comparative study between Renoir and Yeats. Right? So we are going to read the essay. And um, <clears throat> uh, you have to uh, download it. Uh, I will give you the website. Uh, Yeats Society or KL. Yeats Society or KL. <laughs> and uh, go to back issues, back issues. And uh, uh, I forgot the number, and I will tell you. We are going to take a break, and I'll check the number and let you know. Go to the book and get my article, right? A, a, a comparison between uh, Yeats and Renoir. Uh, read the essay, make a summary, okay? Summarize the essay, and also write a poem about Renoir's work. Hmm? Uh, after uh, going to the movies, right? Uh, it, it, it's a very beautiful movie, right? So two works, write a poem on Renoir's work and summarize my article, right? Okay. Okay, now, uh, let's move on. Uh, actually, let's go back to uh, the first poem we did on Monday, the Lake Isle of Industry. First, uh, let us have a look at the uh, Lake Isle, right? Industry. Look at the poem. The Lake Isle of Industry. I will arise and go now and go to Industry and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bin roads will I have there, high for the honey bee and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of morning to where the cricket sings. There, Midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, evening full of linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear late lake waller lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, on the pavement's gray, I hear it in deep hot core. Very beautiful, right? Uh, okay, uh, I got your reaction. Uh, on Monday, last Monday, you uh, wrote something about the, about the poem, and uh, uh, I've gone through all of this, and uh, some of the essays are very impressive, right? And uh, I think uh, I, I can give you some comment. Okay, uh, uh, student one uh, talked about this poem. One of uh, the students, one of the students said, it's like a beautiful painting. Surely, right? Sure, it is, it's, it's like a painting. It is painting, right? Sure, it is. A, in fact, we are going to read another essay that compares Jason Renoir, right? And that's the next week's first essay. Also, uh, I asked you to go see a movie, right, on Renoir, and uh, write a poem about it and submit it next Monday. And student two, student two said, uh, it is a poem that describes the dreaming and awakening process of the poet about Mother Nature, right? The uh, dreaming process, dreaming and awakening process of uh, <clears throat> of the poet about uh, Mother Nature. So, uh, industry represents nature, right? It is a particular island, very small island, but 
uh, the reader, the student, uh, thinks that it represents whole nature. Right? I think he's right, right? And uh, student three likes the expression, uh, from the bell's morning, from the bell's morning, to, to where a cricket sings, right? Uh, from the veil of morning, the veil of morning. Uh, because uh, this expression evokes a scene on the owl in her mind, right? And uh, students three, uh, he is very impressed with the repetition. I will rise and go now and go to industry. Repetition, right? And uh, another student finds the color imagery magnificent. Color, purple, right? Veil, right? White, purple. Um, and um, uh, student six uh, thinks the poem touches his heart just as the speaker earnestly misses the owl in the, he, he is, while he, uh, he is in London, he's staying on London. Uh, he is on a pavement while he uh, got the inspiration, right? Uh, and student seven noticed the passing of time is described beautifully, right? The passage of time is described beautifully. Sure, I think so. And finally, another student finds the rhyme scheme is a very effective way of this, making this poem evocative. Because of rhyme, uh, the poem sounds, uh, evokes uh, something, right? Evokes uh, mood and vivid images and things like that. Okay, also last time we talked about repetition. And, uh, and so, okay, why don't you put down the uh, term, literal terms, repetition. And look for the uh, dictionary. Uh, glossary, English glossary, literally terms, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, put down the definition and uh, try to remember it, right? Probably I will ask you to uh, define uh, these terms, right? Literary terms, repetition, imagery, 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 and rhyme. Rhyme, rhyme scheme, and alliteration, alliteration, and meter, meter, etc. Okay. Uh, okay. Now uh, let us go to another poem uh, by Yeats. Uh, uh, this this is also one of the earliest poems. And uh, many people, uh, many, pe many people uh, learn it by heart, right? So uh, I went to Sligo to attend the International Yeats Summer School. Every year, uh, they, they have a school, summer school on uh, Yeats, and students, scholars, students uh, gather there every summer for, uh, for a month. And uh, it, it's a great gathering, right? And almost all of the scholars remember, all of students uh, remember this, uh, this poem, this particular poem. Very, very uh, mysterious and very beautiful poem. So it's, it's about a... Yeshi uh, uh, imagined that... Uh, he, he heard something, right? Uh, he picked a, he uh, went out fishing and got a trout, fish, and he, he, he was going to cook it. Uh, but uh, suddenly he heard the rustling and he saw a uh, no, beautiful woman disappearing, right? Very mysterious uh, poem, a very beautiful poem. Okay, I'm going to read it. The Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head. 
because a fire was in my head, and cut and peeled the hazel wand, hazel wand, and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing, and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. And when I laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire flame. But something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair. She called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I'm old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands walk among long dappled grass, pluck till time and times are done, the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Very strange, very, very mysterious poem, right? Do you like it? This is the, one of the early poems by H. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's amazing to go through all the poems uh, by H uh, through uh, the first uh, uh, early poems to the last poems. Because uh, his, his poetry, his uh, subject, and his, the form of uh, his poetry uh, evolved continuously. Right? They changed continuously. And uh, some people, some scholars like uh, early poems, and some scholars like later poems, or some like last poem. Last poem. But for me, every, every poem, every single poem is good. Why? Uh, and uh, uh, students are here to learn how to write, right? how to write uh, good essays, right? Uh, and uh, one way is, uh, uh, and one way is uh, to do what Yeats has done, right? Yeats, uh, Yeats uh, wrote a poem. And then he uh, go back to the poem again and again. Right? Even after the poem was published, he go back to the poem and revise it. So uh, there are many versions, many versions of a poem. And uh, probably the, one of the greatest poems is uh, Lee Dan Swan. It's a very short, uh, uh, short, uh, short poem. Uh, the sonnet is a very short poem. Uh, but uh, there are many different versions. Right? When he uh, began the poem, it was not a poem. It, it was an idea. He put down the uh, idea uh, in sentences and then turned them into a poem and re revised it and revised again. And finally, he finished it. So there are different versions. And also, I'm going to deal with uh, another great poem, maybe uh, the greatest poem by Yeats. It's, uh, it's called Sailing to Byzantium. Sailing to Byzantium. And then uh, there's another poem, Byzantium. Two poems, great poems. And there are many versions of uh, Sailing to Byzantium and Byzantium. So uh, I'm going to talk about this, uh, uh, this, these two points later on. So uh, the Song of Wandering Angus. Uh, Wandering Angus. Angus is a uh, uh, Irish god, right? Uh, god of love or Ang yeah, Angus. The Song of Wandering Angus. Uh, Yeats uh, usually uh, uh, began a poem on a personal level, right? On a personal, he began a personal poem, and then make it universal. He made it universal, right? So uh, he begins with a uh, description of woman he, he knew, then it uh, turned into a every woman in the world, 
universal woman. So it's a it, uh, it, it, uh, yeah, peculiar way of doing a poem. Uh, so Angus may be what? Uh, Angus, the one, wandering Angus may represent himself, the speaker, and the poet himself. And look at the uh, personal pronoun. He does not begin with he. Right? He begins with I. So, Yeats is a god. He's not a god, right? <laughs> is is a kind of com uh, uh, comparison, comparison, right? Uh, he felt like uh, the Angus, wandering Angus, right? So, I went out to the Hazel Wood. Hazel Wood. Uh, if you go to, to Sligo, uh, there is a uh, uh, wood near the Sligo. Sligo is a fishing village, a uh, small village. Now it's a big, big uh, tourist site, tourist uh, attraction, and uh, very beautiful with the river running through it. And uh, uh, there are many uh, swans on the lake, on, on, on the river, right? So, I went out to the hazel wood. Uh, there is a hazel wood uh, near Sligo. You know, uh, uh, you've got to take a taxi to go there. Uh, of course, uh, there's lake there. Uh, I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head. A fire was in my head. What does it mean? Is it possible to have a fire in your head? It's a metaphor, right? If you, if you, if you had a fire in your head, what? <laughs> so, uh, because the fire was in my head, meaning what? He is thinking of a woman, or he 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 has passion, passionate. He is passionate, right? Uh, because the fire was in my head, and. Here again, peril structure went out and uh, and cut and peeled and hooked everything. So uh, one, two, three, four. Four lines form one sentence, right? This sentence consists of what? Uh, how many uh, uh, verbs went out, cut and peeled and hooked, right? Uh, and uh, in line three, cut and peeled, cut and, cut and peeled uh, is the same thing. Uh, he is making a uh, fishing pole, fishing pole, cut and, cut and peeled, cut and peeled the hazel wand. Hazel wand, wand is what? He didn't say fishing pole, he said wand. Magic wand, right? Magic wand. So, uh, magic, magic wand, right? Cut and peel the hazel wand and hook the berry to a thread. Hook the berry to a thread. Fishing line, right? Thread. And hooked it. Hooked, hooked the berry. Uh, is a bait. Berry is a bait for, for the trout, right? So, in order to catch a trout, right? So, he went out to the hazel wood because fire was in my head and cut and peel the hazel wand and hooked the berry to a thread. Semicolon meaning this is one sentence. But uh, if you put a period here, stop here, there is a disruption, right? There's disruption in the stanza uh, to make it smooth, right? To make a smooth transition. He uses semicolon instead of period, right? So, uh, and when white moths were on the wing, very beautiful, white moths were on the wing, and moth-like uh, stars were flickering out. I dropped the berry in the stream and caught a little silver trout. And when, uh, when my white moths are on the wing, so is it in the evening or in the morning? Hmm? When, do, when, can you, when can you see, when do you see white moths? In the evening or in the morning, you can't see. It's, it's cold, right? Kind of cold, like this morning. 
um, I, 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 ha I have a uh, shirt on. This one is what? Handmade, huh? knit, hand knit, made in Iran. This is a famous uh, shirt, uh, sweater, right? And uh, I, I bought it in Iran Island last, last summer. So uh, uh, last night it was cold, so, uh, and I, I, I was going to introduce my sweater to you. So, <laughs> so, so the weather helped me, right? Uh, uh, when the white moths were on the wing, uh, what does it mean? In the evening, right? And uh, the lights are on, and uh, white moths are gathering near the lights, right? So, uh, on the wing, when white moths were on the wing, and moth like stars were flickering out, beautiful. Moths are here, there, all over there, and stars in, in the sky are moths like, moths like stars, right? So, moths like stars were flickering out, flickering out, twinkling, flickering out. So, uh, the, the, the night uh, goes on, right? And the stars, more stars are coming out, freaking out, and uh, freaking out. I dropped the berry in the stream. I dropped the berry in the stream. He threw the fishing uh, rind into the stream. I dropped the berry in the stream and caught a little silver trout. Caught a little silver trout. Little silver trout. So, and. Uh, uh, he is going to cook it, right? Yeah. In stanza two. When I had laid it, when I when I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow, I went to blow the fire flame. But, okay, I I had laid it on the floor and went to the, blow the fire flame, blow the fire flame. Uh, look at the verbs, right? In in line one, in the first line. Uh, had laid, lay, laid, laid, right? Had laid. And uh, in line two, went. In line two, the verb is uh, past tense. And in the first line, the, pa the tense is past perfect. So laying down had taken place earlier than going, right? So uh, when I had laid it on the floor, I went to the blow. Uh, went to blow the fire, a uh, uh, fire flame. He blow the blow the fire, right? <laughs> to a flame. Right? But something rustled on the floor. Something rustled on the floor. He could hear something rustling on the floor. What is it? A beautiful lady, right? Um, Something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. B H, jo uh, uh, no. B uh, Bill uh, William 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 Bill Bill, B H, and he was surprised. Who is calling me? <laughs> right. Uh, someone called me by my name. Uh, someone called my called me by by my name. Again. Look at the tense. Someone called me by my name. Call the past tense, and then who? Uh, 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 it had become a glimmering girl. It. What does it refer to? It. The pronoun. The woman. The silver trout. It. Uh, he he called a, a little silver uh, silver trout, and uh, he heard the rustling, and uh, it turned into a woman, and it, call, it had called him by the names, and uh, what? Uh, <clears throat> it had become a glittering girl. So the transformation of the woman took place earlier, right? So uh, 
he the uh, pa tense, right? Past tense, past perfect tense. So it had become a glimmering girl. What kind of girl is it? What kind of hair? With apple blossom in her hair. With an apple blossom in, in her hair, maybe a flower, apple blossom in her hair. Uh, who called me by my name and ran and fade, fade, faded through the brightening air. So uh, it is almost dawn, right? When he went out fishing, it was uh, night. But uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the dawn is breaking. So uh, faded through the brightening air, brightening air. Brightening sky, brightening air. Though I'm old with wondering, <clears throat> though I'm old with wondering, though I'm old with wondering, uh, Angus wandered all, all around the island, right? And he's all, though I'm old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, Hollow lands and hilly lands, right? Valleys, right? Hills, mountains, hollow valley, hollow lands, hilly lands. So, this is called alliteration. Each word uh, begins with the same <clears throat> pronunciation: H, H, hollow, hilly, and then lands, lands. It's called alliter alliter alliterative alliteration. Through hollow lands and hilly lands. <clears throat> I will find out where she has gone. Though I'm old, I will go find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands. Because he was in, his, uh, a fire was in his hand, right? Walk among long dappled grass. Walk among long Dappled grass. Dappled? Like uh, deer? The skin deer? Dappled. Like, like that? Dappled, right? Dappled. <clears throat> okay, dappled grass. Walk along long dappled grass and pluck, 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 till time and times are done. Till pluck. Pluck is a verb, right? What kind of verb is it? Transitive verb. So it must have an object, pluck something, hmm? pluck a flower, pluck. So the object is what? Pluck the apples, pluck the apples. Hmm? The object is uh, the last line and the, 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 the second from at the bottom, the second line. Uh, pluck the silver apples of the moon and pluck the golden apples of sun. Till what? Till time and times are done. Right? Until the last moment. Right? When the time is done, I'm going to pluck these all kinds of uh, apples. Right? The silver apples or golden apples. And the silver apples, the moon, moon, sun the moon and sun. Uh, uh, so this is a very mysterious poem. And uh, 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 why don't you go uh, and read uh, A Vision by Yeats. Uh, he spent his whole, not, not whole, his whole life uh, writing this book. And the book consists of uh, prose. Uh, written, uh, written in different periods. So uh, this, this is Mistress book, A Vision. And uh, I translated the book for the first time here in Korea. And uh, there is a bilingual edition, A Vision. Uh, and uh, it, according to the book, uh, Yeish uh, classifies humanity into uh, different types. Uh, so the, he divided the face of the moon, right? full moon, dark moon, and faces, 28 faces, and compared humanity with the 
faces of moon. Right? Very interesting. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. Let's go to the uh, essay itself. Uh, Page 186. <coughs> the same essay we did last time, right? Reading the poetics of J.M. Singh. <coughs> we are finished with uh, two sections, section three. Uh, Singh has a keen eye observing everything around him from the very beginning of the travelogue to the end. A travelogue means a travel book, right? The observations are subtle and in full detail, which find expressions in his plays. How he begins his first sailing to the island is depicted in the third paragraph of part one, uh, is a depiction of the uh, Aran Island. <clears throat> Maybe the biggest island, Ara, Ara, Aran, Aran Mo, I think, Aran Mo. A low line of shore was visible at first on the right between the movement of the waves and fog. But when you came further, it was lost sight of, and nothing could be seen but the mist curling in the rigging and a small circular form. We can imagine the steamer, oh, it, this is Galway. This is a depiction of Galway. He's leaving Galway uh, for Aran Islands, and he's leaving the port, Galway. Uh, we can imagine the steamer leaving the Galway Quay and soon in the middle of sea. Then the highly sensitive thing is all over the pages of the book, a feast to the eye. So many exquisite portrayals encountered of the people, animals, birds, the sea and waves, the sky and clouds and the sun and rain and so on. Uh, for example, the rain has cleared off and I have had my first real introduction to the island and its people. Page three, and if you go to page 19, as I was going across the sand hills, one dumb-sailed hooker, meaning ship, glided slowly out to begin her voice. Another, another, <coughs> Uka beat up to the pier. Troops of red cattle, driven mostly by the women, were coming up from several directions, forming with the green of long tract of grass that separates the sea from the locks, new unity of color. Not only the nature around him, but also the ways these island people live, as they illustrate their use of time and life. On page 11, is, is he depict, he illust, explains uh, how they use time. The knowledge of the time on the island depends, curiously enough, on the direction of the wind. Very interesting, right? The direction of wind. Nearly all the cottages are built like this one with two doors opposite each other, the more sheltered of which lies open all day to give light to the interior. If the wind is northerly, the south door is open, and the shadow of the doorpost moving across the kitchen floor indicates the hour. As soon, however, as the wind changes to the south, the other door is open, and the people who never think of putting up a primitive dial are at a loss. Interesting, right? They do not use dial. Uh, sundial and things like that. The system of doorways has another curious result. It usually happens that all the doors on one side of the village pathway are lying open, with women sitting, across, sitting about on the threshold, while on the other side, the doors are shut and there is no sign of life. The moment the wind changes, everything is reversed. And sometimes when I come back to the village after an hour's walk, there seems to have been a general flight from one side of the way 
to the other. Seeing, being tender-hearted, depicts meticulously the people, animals, plants on the island. The island is sometimes dull and sometimes beautiful. For example, it is dull. On page 23, for example, a week of sweeping fogs has passed over and given me a strange sense of exile and desolation. I walk around the island nearly every day, yet I can see nothing anywhere but a mass of wet rocks, a strip of surf, and then a tumult of waves. The salty limestone has grown um, the stone has grown black with the water that is dripping on it. Wherever I turn, there is the same great obsession, twining and wreathing itself among the narrow fields, and the same well from the wind that shrieks and whistles in the loose rubble of the walls. And sometimes it is beautiful, for example. It has cleared, and the sun is shining with a luminous warmth that makes the whole island glisten with the splendor of a jam, fills the sea and sky with the radiance of blue light. I've, called out, I've come out to lie on the rocks where I have the black edge of the northern island in front of me, Galway Bay, too, too blue almost to look at. On the right, the Atlantic on my left, a perpendicular cliff under my ankles, and over me, in newborn gulls that chase each other in a white cirrus of the wings. People and their customer, what, we, what he has observed with deep interest, the observation of which is to find full use in his play in Riders to the Sea and other plays. The funeral customs are as follow. After mass, this morning an old woman was buried. She lived in the cottage next mine. More than once before noon, I heard the faint echo of the kin, wailing kin, right, crying. I did not go to the wake for fear my presence might jar upon the mourners. But all last night, I could hear the stroke of a hammer in the yard in the middle of a little crowd of idlers. The next of kin labored slowly at the coffin. When the coffin was carried out, sewn loosely in sailcloth, held near the ground by three cross poles lashed upon the top. As we moved down to the low eastern portion of Ireland, nearly all the men, all the, all the oldest women, wearing petticoats over their heads, came, came out and joined in the procession. While the grave was being opened, the women sat down among the flat tombstones bordered with a pale fringe of early blackened, and began the wild cane, or crying for the dead. Each old woman, as she took a turn in the leading recitative, seemed possessed for the moment with a profound ecstasy of grief, swaying to and fro, bending her forehead to the stone before her, while she called out to the dead with a perpetually recurring chant of sobs. All round the graveyard, other women, wrinkled women, looked out from under the deep ready, uh, red petticoats that cloaked them, rocked themselves with the same rhythm, and intoned the inarticulate chant that is sustained by all as an accompaniment. The morning had been beautifully fine, but as they lowered the coffin into the grave, thunder rumbled overhead, and hailstones hissed among the bracken. In Inishman, one is forced to believe in sympathy between man and nature. One day, Singh happens to see a few rowers fighting with a rough sea, his eyes reverting alternately on one huge wave after another, thrashing against the fragile animal skin boat and on the people in it. Late this evening, I saw three old crocs with two old women in, a, in her beside the rowers landing at the, at the slip through a heavy roll. They were coming from Inisha, the smallest island, Inisha, and they rowed up quickly, quickly enough till they were within the yards of the surf, surf line where they spun round and waded with a prow towards the sea while wave after wave passing under them and broke on the remains of sleep. Five minutes passed, 
10 minutes passed. Still, they waited with the oars, just paddling in the water, and their heads turned over their shoulders. I was beginning to think they would have to give up and row, uh, row round the lee side of the island when the crocs seemed suddenly turned into a living thing. The prow was, was again toward the sleep, leaping and hurling itself through the spray before it touched the men in the ball wheeled round. Two white legs came out of the prow like the flash of sword, and before the next wave arrived, he had dragged the crocs out of danger. Singh is excited to have watched the island people coping with nature. Generally, he, wants, he at once marvels at the wisdom of these people and feels so sorry that people in Aramor are no longer the same as in Ishman. He noticed fine change in Aramor and in Ishman. Aramor is the biggest island, and in Ishman is the middle island. In Ishman is the smallest island. Uh, the North Island, a bit modernized. North Island meaning the biggest one. I'm in the North Island again, looking out with a singular sensation to the clip across the sound. It is hard to believe that those hovels, meaning the huts, I can see, I can just see in the South, a field with people whose lives have this strange quality that is found in the oldest poetry and legend. Compared with them, the falling off that has come into the increased prosperity of this island is full of discouragement. The charm which the people over there share with the birds and flowers has been repressed here by the anxiety of men who are eager for gain. The, the eyes and expression are different, though the faces are the same. Even the children here seem to have an indefinable modern quality that is absent from the man of Inishman. Before he leaves Aran Island, Singh keeps, keeps in mind all that he has seen and felt as exquisitely recorded in the Aran Island. It is full of visual, musical beauty, and strong feelings of island, islanders in dire conditions of sea and island. It is moving and fires the imagination of many who will come to the island. It is a peon to people, animals, plants, nature in Aran. Uh, section 4. Now, a few comparisons between the Aran Islands and Riders to the Sea. Riders to the Sea is a masterpiece, the earliest masterpiece uh, by, by Singh. Right? I'm going to compare them briefly. Uh, a few comparisons uh, can display how Singh makes use of his material in his play. I'm interested in how the things he has seen and recorded in the collection of the essays fit the play, fit in the play, how parts coheres, cohere as a whole. About the language of the Aran Islanders, Singh talks a lot in, the, in, in this book, as discussed above. Han, T.L. Han, a scholar, points to the three aspects of Singh's dramatic language, idiom, imagery, and rhythm. He says, the idiom requires some familiarity, but, but that it does not present any difficulty in understanding. For, example, for instance, the way means so that as in, give me the letter, and I'll put them in the loft, a uh, uh, tough loft, the way she won't know of them at all. <clears throat> I took this from the play. It also means so that she or he, he or she can or should, as or as if, or and in, in what way, uh, etc. In the early, early part of the book of the essays, what interests Singh greatly is canvas canoe. Uh, <clears throat> here is his description. Early this morning, the man of the house came over for me with a four-oared Carox boat. Right? That is, a Carox with four rowers and four oars on either side, as each man uses two, and we set off a little before noon. It gave me a moment of exquisite satisfaction to find myself moving away from civilization, this rude canvas canoe of a, of a model that has served primitive races since man first went to sea. The sail is only used as an aid, so the man continued to row after it had gone up. And as they occupied the four cross, four cross seats, 
I lay on the canvas at the stern and the frame of the slender lath, which bent and quivered as the wave passed under them. In the play Riders to the Sea, there is a mention of this canoe when the old woman, Maria, is now recalling all the men lost as his last son is just going to the sea. Maria is taken from the uh, Riders to the Sea. Maria, in a low but clearly, is the little, the like of him, meaning the priest, knows of the sea, Butley will be lost now, and let you call in uh, Iman and make, make, make me a good coffin out of the white boards, for I won't live up after them. Maria, they were Shemus and his father and his own father again were lost in a dark night, and not a stick or a sign was seen of them when the sun went up. There was patch after, after, after uh, there was patch after, was drowned out of a rock that turned over. Here we could imagine that when Singh was first in the rocks, in the boat, he felt the waves under him, and he must felt that when the wind rises and the sea is rough, life in it is merely at the mercy of nature, which finds expression in Maria. It is just what Maria has expressed, ex experienced. As she says, it's the like of, uh, it's, it's little, it's the little, the like of him, knows of the sea. While he, she is drifting into past nightmares, the body of Bartley, he, he was drowned, right? He, he's dead. The body of Bartley is being carried into the room. She asks, is it Patch or Michael or what was it at all? Thus, the Patch, the name of uh, the son, uh, drowned, right? Uh, thus, the past and the present, Michael, who is just drowned. The past and the present are mixed up as if a mind is muddy with a two or a three, inclusive uh, last son, Bartley, whose body she will now see in a moment the serious blow to her life. Last death staring her in the face. And I think it proper to touch on one mastery stroke of seeing as dramatist. Nora, Nora is a young, a young daughter. Uh, she is uh, Nora. She's quiet, she's quiet now. She's talking about uh, their mother. She's quiet now and easy, but the day Michael was drowned, you could hear her crying out from this room to the spring well. It's fond uh, she is of Michael, and would, would anyone have thought that? Catherine, another daughter. An old woman will soon be tired of anything she will do, and isn't it nine days herself is after crying and keening, making great sorrow in the house? The youngest daughter, Nora, as well as Catherine, hardly understands her mother. Their understanding of their mother, arousing the audience's intense sympathy over the humanly unbearable tragic burden on Maria. Her daughters are not sympathetic to their mother Maria, who has made all the efforts to save her last son on son battery. She is not less same than Michael. Maria now loses everything, and she has nothing left. She speaks to herself and the world, which to me is the grandest monologue the modest one actor, one act play could have achieved in the 20th century. Uh, this is the ending of the uh, play. Maria sp speaks to herself. Uh, they are all together, uh, they, they are all together this time, and the end is come. May the Almighty have mercy on Bartley's soul, on Michael's soul, on the souls of Seamus and Patch, and Stephen and Sean. All of them are drowned. And may he, meaning God, may he have mercy on my soul, Nora, and the soul of everyone is left living in the world. Michael has a clean burial in the far north, meaning uh, his body was not found. Clean burial. Michael, uh, Michael has a clean burial in the far north. By the grace of the almighty God, Bartley will have a fine coffin out of white boards. Uh, on uh, 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 is so poor, and you cannot buy the coffin, right? Coffin. So uh, 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 she bought a coffin, and for herself, may, for herself maybe, but uh, 
it has to be used for a last sun, right? So uh, Basli will have fine coffin out of, out of white balls and deep grave, deep grave, surely. What more can we want than that? No man at all can be living forever. We must be satisfied. She kneels down again, and the curtain falls slowly. <clears throat> this surely is the sublimest moment of an old woman who prevails over all the, the whole world of Aran Island, and metaphorically, even over the almighty God nature. God nature cannot help us stop making the greatest speech, preaching all, living or dead, him and nature, yet. On the human level, it seems it is still a great pity the old woman without any single son left is thankful to the almighty God for Michael having had a clean burial in the far north, who had been the great Rowan Fisher. She is still thankful to God for Bartley now having a fine coffin out of white boards and deep grave, surely, with the aid of the rope. The play does not leave any room for the audience weeping in the tightly woven space of one act with most intense dramatic effects, rippling every instant from start to finish the audience's mind and heart. In this final monologue by Maria, there is a stage direction in the middle. She pauses, and the king rises a little more loudly from the woman, and then sinks away, continuing. Singh has seen the island in Ishman for a week. I walk around the island nearly every day, yet I can see nothing anywhere but a mass of wetlock, a strip of surf, and then a tumult of waves. Then this describes wind. It is as if we are hearing the keen of the women in this, in, the, in this play that accompanies the last monologue. The, sli uh, the slightest uh, limestone has grown black with the water that is dripping on it. And wherever I turn there, there is the same gray obsession twining breathing itself among the narrow fields. And the same wail from the wind that shrieks and whistles in the rubble of the wall. All that Singh has seen in the Aran Island become part of play, which makes it so moving a play, just as we experienced in this last monologue. Okay, we'll take a 10 minutes break. <laughs>